Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including James C. Smith, Miranda Janelle, Justin Zellers, and our new patron, Adam. Everybody, welcome Woo-hoo. in, Adam. Good job. On this episode of DTNS, more evidence that AI might not take as many jobs as we fear. And Dr. Nikki tells us some of the science being done on the International Space Station thanks to the Axion 3 mission. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 22nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From T-Town in Alabama, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. T-Town where it's always tea time. Yes. But not drinking tea. Well, actually, they drink a lot I of tea. I am drinking tea currently. Yeah. Are you, what kind of tea are you drinking? It is English breakfast. Ah, Keeping it simple. Very From classic. my DTNS yeah. mug. Uh, yeah. See the store for more information. No, I'm just kidding. Beautiful. Yes. Go <laughs> check it out. Uh, all right. We got a lot of sciencey goodness. Thanks to Dr. Nikki being with us today. Let's start with the quick Exciting. hits. Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo estimates that Apple has sold between 160 and 180,000 Apple Vision Pro units. Uh, initial sales were fast. Shipping times quickly slipped from launch day February 2nd to mid to late February. But Kuo notes that those shipping times have remained pretty steady since that first 48 hours, implying that sales have slowed. No one expects high sales or profitability from the first generation of a headset, but Morgan Stanley was projecting 300 to 400,000 should ship this year. And so falling short of that would indicate that Apple overestimated its demand. Apple Vision Pro costs $3,500. And if you don't pay $499 for Apple Care, making it a smooth 4,000, uh, you might have to pay $799 if you crack the front screen. Even with Apple Care, you're going to pay $299 for each incident of repair. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman believes new iPads will arrive in March or April, surprising no one. Starting in March, in compliance with the Digital Markets Act, users of Meta products in the EU will be able to unlink some accounts, particularly Instagram, Messenger, and Facebook. You will also be able to unlink your Facebook gaming and Facebook marketplace accounts. However, gaming will then be limited to single player games if it's unlinked. Makes sense. And marketplace users who will unlink will not be able to use Messenger to communicate with buyers and sellers through marketplace. These changes apply in the European econ- economic area and as well as Switzerland. Got to include the Swiss. Yeah, they, they jumped in on this one. Good for them. <laughs> uh, Pocket Pair's Pal World is described by many, including IGN, as Pokemon with guns. Uh, You may have seen this going around. It looks like a Nintendo game, but it's not. It's from Pocket Pair, uh, and it's got cute little, you know, fuzzy characters like Pokemon, but they sometimes pull out really big guns and shoot each other. It launched in early access on Friday, January 19th, and everybody thought it was a funny meme, but it surprised the world by passing Cyberpunk 2077 to set the mark for the fifth highest peak number of players, 1,291,967 players at its peak. It is the most played game on Steam right at the moment. And Pocket Pair estimates more than 5 million copies of Pal World were sold in its first three days. Uh, This is really, uh, even the gaming world was not expecting this one. Uh, We're going to ask Scott Johnson more about this on Wednesday's show, but uh, does this look fun to you, Nikki? (laughs) I'm 100% would play this if my computer hadn't died. Um, And also Mm -hmm. I feel like they hit the internet niche of like, weird random thing, cute little toy with a gun. Like, that's perfect. Yes, of course, this is making numbers. That makes sense. Yeah. And made um, it playable. Apparently, it's a decent game, too. So yeah, I guess that's important. That's key, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, so after that, Ford is showing off a 48-inch curved dashboard display in its 2024 Lincoln Nautilus. This car, not submarine, also runs Android and has a 5G network connection. Nearly three years ago, Ford had announced it would forego its BlackBerry QNX-powered version of Ford Sync with Android, uh, Android's version of Sync. But the switch took a little bit longer than they anticipated. And now Ford is joining Tesla, Cadillac, Mercedes-Benz, and BMW in putting larger screens on the dash. I, for one, am excited about that, although it does tend to distract me. Uh, But Ford is also adding customization features like recognizing the driver and adjusting default settings accordingly. I'm in Uh, for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I do like physical buttons, though, for some things. When you're driving, you just need to do it by feel, so... 
We'll see. Gotcha. Uh, Chinese state newspapers and Bloomberg report that NVIDIA co-founder Jensen Huang visited NVIDIA's offices in Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Beijing earlier this month. Uh, NVIDIA is barred from selling its most advanced AI chips to Chinese companies, but it's trying to maintain sales in that market by designing AI chips that get around U.S. restrictions. Actually, I, I keep hearing it saying get around. It's not get around U.S. restrictions. It's complying with U.S. restrictions. What's the most powerful chip we can sell to China without violating the U.S. restrictions, uh, but still something that's useful for Chinese companies. However, Chinese companies are turning uh, more frequently to domestic companies like Huawei as they get better at designing chips. Uh, and China bought a near record 40 billion of chip gear uh, as they they try to be able to build all this stuff domestically. And that is a look at the quick hits. Scientists at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, a.k.a. CSAIL, conducted a study to estimate what impact artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning, large language models, the whole ball of wax, will have on jobs. Automation may be a better way of saying this. What impact it is automation by software going to have on jobs? So they asked workers what these kinds of automated tools would have to be able to do to replace their job, to replace the tasks that they do. Then they modeled what tasks were possible to replace with existing technology and how much it would cost to develop and maintain that. Uh, they limited this to jobs requiring visual analysis. So this isn't every single job. If you're looking at different jobs, you might get a different result, but Things like quality control, visual inspection, parts inspection, things like that is what they focused on just to see. Uh, I get it. Just to see uh, what uh -huh. this would do. Uh, keeping all of that in mind, the study found that there's a lot of potential to automate these kinds of tasks, but it wouldn't be economic to do so, at least not for a while. So, so Nikki, let me give you an example here, okay? Oh, you're, yes. you're a baker now. Yeah, totally. Yeah? My, my backup plan, yes. <laughs> you ever bake? I'm actually, I've never, never talked yeah, about Yeah, I can. I yeah. made a banana bread uh, yesterday. Well, there you go. So, so Nikki's banana bread bakery uh, pays <laughs> five bakers. Uh, you got five different bakers, $48,000 a year. Uh, and 6% of their time is spent looking at the banana bread to make sure it's okay, right? Quality control, just visual inspection. Everything looks right before we put it out for sale. You can automate that. You can have computer vision inspect banana bread and do it as well as a human would, you know, catch the problems as, as often as a human would and save the bakery $14,000 a year. That's usually what we hear. That's mm -hmm. usually what we hear. It's like, oh, they can automate this task. It'll save a company $14,000. Okay. So that sounds pretty good if you're the baker. Like, oh, okay, I can, I can, I can save some money. Uh, maybe even lower the prices of my food or or increase the output or something like that, right? Yeah, that's what I'd be doing. So far, so good. Great. It's just going to cost you one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars <laughs> to develop this system from scratch. And I assume we don't have numbers for buying a pre-made bakery analysis system, but. Okay. Okay. No, I'll, that's a I'll good, good question. Like, <laughs> sure. It'd be 165,000 to buy it from scratch, but hasn't somebody done this at another bakery or mm -hmm. some companies like we'll develop it and sell it to lots of bakeries and pay for that 165,000 in no time. Well, let's just jump past that. Let's just say like, all right, let's say it's not going to cost you 165,000 because somebody has sunk that cost. It's only going to cost you $122,840 a year to maintain it. And I, can I ask, what are we maintaining? Is it engineers programming it, checking for bugs and things like that? It's some of that, but I think a lot of it, and and I need to dig in uh, more in the study uh, to find out just how much, but a lot of it is is running the data, running the oh, data. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, Someone just just, just being able to, to have the model do this well enough. Now, D that's why we pointed out this is about computer vision. This is about in visual mm -hmm. inspection. Certain other kinds of automation could be done locally and wouldn't have the high maintenance costs that this would have. And I guess servers play into this as well. Yeah, exactly. So it is m too costly, according to this study, for most uses of computer vision to economically replace people. Uh, and the, 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 they pointed out that even if the cost got cheaper by 20% a year, it would take more than a decade for it to become cost efficient to save that $14,000. Now, the study didn't consider uh, systems that just augment 
visual inspection and mm -hmm. speed it up versus replacing it. Uh, that would have a different impact. It did not consider new tasks and jobs. Like what if you have the AI maintain the AI system? Does, does that <laughs> help uh, save you any money with the engineering side of thing and the software side of thing? Uh, so there's still some questions here, but I think this is just a good example of when you're thinking about this stuff, if you want to think about it fairly to remember that like, okay, saves me $14,000 a year, but how much does it cost to run? Cause if it's more than 14,000, it's not worth doing. Yeah, I actually love this study because I run into this all the time with just like my family, honestly, who are like AI, you know, it's going to take all our jobs and I, no one really has the analyses to back them up in their, in their back pocket. And so things like this are great. It kind of brings back this, like, why are we making AI do all the art? Why can't we make it like check our emails? And like, probably cause right now it's cost prohibitive, but, yeah. um, sometimes I want to pay $122,000 a year to make it check my emails. <laughs> I cannot afford that, but, <laughs> right, uh, right. but I, I do like the breakdown that they did and, and I want to see more of this for more job types and I'm sure it's going to get better, you know, as AI becomes more omnipresent. Yeah. And and this isn't me trying to say like, don't worry, there'll be no problems from AI because there, there definitely will. Oh, yeah. uh, but the, this gives me hope that it will, it will disrupt things slower, uh, which is good. Yeah. The, the slower it disrupts things, the better it is because it gives us a chance to get used to it, to find new things to do with the excess capacity that humans do. Uh, and well, continue, adaptation period. Yeah. Yeah. Adaptation. Uh, continue to identify what it is that we can do best uh, and and do that. Uh, and that's what happened with computer revolution. And we didn't see people thrown out of work by computers. Mm -hmm. um, it's somewhat happened with the internet revolution too, where, where the internet created jobs rather than replacing jobs. So yeah, I like, I like this study as far as it goes, it is not the last word though. So as always excited more for more. Uh, the slim moon lander, we talked about this quickly on Friday, made Japan the fifth country to successfully land a spacecraft on the moon intact, but the orientation was off. I don't know if we actually talked about this much on Friday. Uh, despite slim being nicknamed the moon sniper because of its precision landing capabilities, whoops, it didn't land as precise as they wanted. The solar panels are pointed west and the sun on the moon right now where they landed is to the east. So they're not getting the sun on the solar panels, which means the batteries aren't charging. Uh, so they turned off the battery uh, in order to make sure that there's still some battery left for them to try some other things later. Um, they operated for about three hours collecting, you know, some details and some images and other data. Uh, and the battery was at 12%. That gave me panic when I saw that. Yeah. I was like, 12%, go uh -oh. plug in. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's kind of what they did. Um, but based on what they were able to gather, uh, they think that the sun will move into a position over the next two weeks where it will be in the West and therefore shining on the solar panels. They don't know exact position. They don't know how much sun it will get. Uh, but they're hoping that it'll get enough to charge that battery back up and they'll be able to do a little more with it than they could in the three hours that they had before. Yeah, from what I heard, they were um, pretty happy with the data that they collected, but the uh, mission, whoever was in charge of the mission was frowning during his interview and he said, like, I, I'm not completely satisfied with what they did and <laughs> he was all uh, frustrated. Yeah. I can understand this is probably a many years in the making project and um, to have it not go perfectly. I mean, it happens a lot with the uh, space stuff because there's only so much you can predict. But, um, you know, it's good that they got data anyway. I'm sure they had a lot of backups planned into this to make sure that that happened, including leaving those 12% for it yeah. to hopefully maybe catch something else on the way back out. But um, uh, interesting start for, the, uh, for JAXA. I feel like space travel is a lot harder than we got used to. Yeah, uh, we got really lucky in the beginning. <laughs> uh huh. We put a lot, a lot of effort, right? Yeah. Uh, it, because we only had a few shots, and so we were very focused on not killing astronauts and doing things successfully. Mm. Uh, but as things become more common, and as things are uncrewed, which means you're not risking human lives, I'm not saying the focus is lost, but you know, you just you just run into the law of averages more. 
And it could be that the, um, maybe we're a lot more open about communication about what's going on right now. It could be that if this was the first like robot moon landing, we would have been like, this is a massive success. And like, maybe wouldn't have talked about it shutting off early, but this is so in quotes common now, uh, that we get all the details and we're like, oh, another moon landing, you know, it shut off a bit early. Not great. 50, 50, you know, and, and this one did better than many. (laughs) In, in that it actually landed successfully. It didn't crash into the moon and destroy exactly. itself. And maybe next time don't have as much of a cocky nickname. <laughs> that might help. <laughs> the moon sniper. I know. I think that's probably the reason that guy was so upset. He's like, oh, why did we, why did we embrace that nickname? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's really difficult to do this stuff. So I, yeah. I try to remind myself that like, it's, it's not that somebody screwed up. Uh, although maybe it, it's more maybe. likely there's just un, unanticipated, uh, variables that. Yeah. That there's so many variables from. that you can't calculate. Like the, the moon dust is going the different direction with this yeah. propulsion jet that you just can't simulate that on a computer or on earth. So maybe they'll learn from their mistakes. Yes, we, that's the thing. We always learn from the mistakes. There's that they, they were able to collect data even in that three hours. Hopefully, they'll be able to collect more data. The two rovers properly deployed, uh, that they were able to find that out. So if they can get the battery charged back up, they can operate those rovers and do some more of the mission. Uh, and uh, so good, good luck, uh, little moon sniper. May good luck, slim. Be in your favor. <laughs> yes, may the sun be on your west side soon. May slim not be shady. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yes. How did we miss that one till now? <laughs> good job. Uh, may slim not be shady in this case. Uh, folks, we have a lot of good stuff going on at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Yesterday, I did a stream with Eileen Rivera uh, called What We're Streaming. Uh, we've got the Apple Vision show coming up. If you if you haven't looked around for that, uh, Sarah and Eileen are going to be hosting that as well. Uh, and we also have top five at youtube.com slash daily tech news show, uh, where I break down five things to know about technology this week. I looked back at my five favorite pieces of software from the 1990s, some of which I still keep right here with me all the time. Uh, You can (laughs) catch it. Windows 97, Tom? No, it's WordPerfect. Corel Suite 7. Yeah. As featured in the top five, uh, go check it out. It's top five software from the 1990s at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Last week, NASA launched the Axiom 3 mission from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and successfully docked with the International Space Station. It's the third private astronaut mission to the International Space Center. Uh, The four European member crew uh, was aboard a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. You hear a lot about things not working, uh, but when they work, you don't hear about it. This is a a SpaceX uh, rocket, a SpaceX uh, capsule, and they all docked and made it on and everything's good. Uh, Now the crew is scheduled to conduct 30 different experiments while aboard the ISS, uh, so we thought we'd look at some of these experiments. It's because, Nikki, you're a working scientist. You you do experiments all the time. So it's kind of fun to look at what astronauts are doing as far as science up on the International Space Station. Yeah, and, and there's some exciting ones in here that actually line up with my research. And that's part of why I, I got wind of this. Um, I, they're always doing a ton of experiments up on the ISS, um, but this had like a new cluster of them. So I figured we'd we'd check them out. Um, and I, I'm starting with a selection. I'm not covering all 30 of them, but here's a selection of ones that I was interested in. Okay, cool. Hint, yeah, I like this. It skews towards biology. <laughs> that makes sense. If you don't know, Dr. Sorry. Ingrid- studies you study skulls right like i study brains and all yeah, the brains and skulls and lots stuff of like biology that. stuff yeah. yeah um but so starting with the italian space agency they're planning on investigating the molecular signatures of certain biomarkers so markers that you can find in substances in humans i, th- I believe it's humans to understand how space missions affect yes the human body um, one of their targets of interest is also a target of my interest, which is the beta amyloid mm-hmm. protein. Um, you may have heard of this in the media. This is related to Alzheimer's disease. If it misfolds or accumulates in your brain, it basically clogs off your brain and is a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in, they're studying this in two parts. One of them is to understand how it acts in microgravity and if it's maybe folding weirdly and 
that's kind of just an experiment to, to better understand the protein itself. We don't know too much about it. And the other is potentially for the long term to see if there are long term effects of space flight. So potentially Alzheimer's in space, question mark, mm -hmm. maybe more Alzheimer's, maybe less Alzheimer's. I think this is really cool. Uh but mostly because I so, study this. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that makes sense that this one would catch your eye. And and certainly something that studies like, oh, are you at elevated risk for anything if you travel mm -hmm. through space? If we're going to be doing extended trips to the moon and, and Mars, we the more we know about that, the better. I mean, it, also, I think it's interesting to just see like, oh, how does it fold in space? Yeah. Does going to space unfold them like what if it reduced them i'm not saying it will but like that would be amazing to know and then send all the old people into orbit so that they <laughs> get over their alzheimer's be they amazing. can colonize mars it's fine yeah yeah <laughs> yeah who knows I'm, I'm really curious there's so many unknowns with stuff like this we don't have a lot of long term in terms of alzheimer's long term um astronauts i mean i think i don't know what the longest flight has been but it's a, a few years i assume so mm -hmm. not enough to yeah. develop alzheimer's so interesting um, they have other medical experiments that the Italian uh, group is doing. They're doing a study on the effects of microgravity on ovarian cells. Uh, this is another kind of long-term study. First, they want to see uh, how the hormone production works and how it's regulated in space. But they're thinking about, you know, research for, at one, on one hand, improving fertility treatments on Earth, but also beginning to research and understand reproduction off Earth. So hmm. um, space sex, really. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's really not cool. Not space well. X, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this this is important, especially because it's a combined benefit, right? It can it can help on Earth now. Yeah. So for the people who are like, well, I don't care about going to Mars. What's it going to do for me? It can it can help people now. And but all also, of these experiments are like that. Yeah. If if we do want to go to Mars, uh, then uh, you know people are going to want to reproduce. So you know. And I'm, I'm also glad that they uh, went with ovarian cells instead of sperm cells, just because it always tends to be the male mm -hmm, cell first. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, slight pride on my end for that. I f yeah. And I, I you know, I, I hope I'm not uh, bet betraying my perceived gender when I say this, but uh, I, I feel like the, the, the egg is more important. There's yeah, lots a little of bit. sperms out there. It's a bit more complex. Harder to get the egg going. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. How about the non-biology slash physics experiments? Yeah, so I include a few of those just for the non-biology fans that we have, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over them because I am not a physicist. But the Italian team is also testing radiation shield materials that were developed in race cars originally, um, uh, because how Italian of them. And the Turkish team is testing metal alloys for use in space, potentially looking at even creating new alloys from the conditions that would be in space, like microgravity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also testing more microgravity experiments on fluid dynamics. Um, I'm not going to develop further on that. <laughs> the Swedish team is analyzing thunderstorm clouds from space. They named this the Thor Davis project, which I nice. thought was great. Uh, and also properties of plasma, the, uh, the gas slash liquid, not the blood. Mm -hmm. All three groups are also testing the use of AI because, of course, there's an AI story. Um, they have a sort of a crew companion who's going to help with various tasks and uh, mission efficiency and crew support. Very vague. Reminds me of a certain <laughs> 2001 Space Odyssey. I'm companion. sorry, Nikki. I can't <laughs> look at your thunderclouds right now. <laughs> I have disconnected yeah. the airlock. Yeah. Okay, those are those are good, uh, <laughs> and you know, little little Forza in space, uh, always a good thing. Thunderstorm <laughs> clouds, particularly, I think, is interesting. The better yeah. we get at, uh, at weather information, the better. Not only for like predicting the rain, but but predicting the climate and and seeing where it's going. And just understanding uh, it. Yeah, uh, this launch also included the first Turkish astronaut, uh, Alper Gezeravcha. What is the Turkish space agency sending to the ISS? I like some of their projects because we get some good SciComm. Speaking of SciComm on DTNS, a little bit of inception here. But mm -hmm. uh, they're also doing a bit of uh, CRISPR. So the Turkish Space Agency is testing CRISPR gene-edited plants. Uh, Arid Aridopsis is kind of the rat of the plant world for experiments. Um, it's part of the mustard family. They're testing stress, microgravity, and salt tolerances on the ISS. They're also going to be analyzing their astronauts' T cells to see if there's any upregulation of specific genes during space travel. Hmm. Um, he'll be 
irradiated a little bit more than usual. So I'd assume there'd be some genetic changes. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also a really cool project developed by 13-year-old STEM students, and it focuses on propolis, which is bee glue that they use to build their hives. Ah, (laughs) And they want to see if they can use it in space. Uh, It also has antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory properties. Um, And the students also came up with testing the use of algae as a life support form. It could potentially help regulate temperature, recycle waste, and even act as a source of fuel. So kind of cool nature slash space uh, things going on. And finally, for the Turkish SciComm example, there's also an amateur radio program that is conducting, sorry, connecting STEM students to astronauts during their entire stay and teaching them about space. And I thought that was great. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really cool. And the algae stuff is very like ripped yeah. from the pages of sci-fi, like uh, to see like, okay, what what actually works? That, that's yes. very exciting. I'm excited for um, the algae. What about when the astronauts come back to Earth? What happens then? Sure. So uh, as usual, the astronauts will usually go a lot, undergo a lot of tests when they come back. These are some specific ones, but uh, they'll have, in this case, MRIs to check uh, whether their brain um, expression has changed in any way. They're going to look at their vascular health because uh, microgravity probably affects vasculature. Doing DNA analysis, again, for potentially radiation or any kind of gene expression that has changed. Neural stem cell analysis to see if it changes them developing into different kinds of brain cells. Um, And sleep pattern tests to check for spaceflight sleep changes. Um, Also, I just wanted to add my... Oh, sorry. That's it. (laughs) That's it for the (laughs) tests. I had a little surprise, but I'm going to let you ask me about it. (laughs) Oh, okay. No, no, you could go ahead and say that because I I know that... We've talked about the scientific things that catch your eye, and I and and, and that's legitimate. Uh, but was there anything as a non scientist that caught your eye? Yeah, so this was perfect because it was just slipped into the list of experiments as a very you know <clears throat> fancily written way. But um, the Italian space agency is sending up ready made barilla pasta to be <laughs> heated up and tasted in microgravity. Because, of course, they're doing that and they have to keep a diary about um, their eating style and taste and preferences for the pasta in space. So that kind of makes me want to be an astronaut. It's not the first pasta to be eaten in space by any stretch, right? Oh, dang. I I wasn't sure if it was. Yeah, I can't can't have been because there's there's so many like freeze dried spaghettis and pastas. There must must be something specific about this barilla pasta. It's ready made. I don't know if that that does anything. but Very cool. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Nikki. Uh, let's take a look real quickly at the mailbag. Uh, we got one from Andrew, one of our longtime uh, bosses. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Andrew says, once Netflix stopped shipping DVD and Blu-rays, I looked for a while for an adequate replacement. He tried Gamefly. He tried Scarecrow. Wasn't really happy with the selection at either. It felt like Netflix had almost everything, and it was hard to find older, less popular titles on these new services. Then I turned to my local library... And it's awesome. I live in the suburbs of a large city, so maybe other libraries aren't as good, but I can get everything from my library. They have programs where they pull movies from neighboring cities if my local library doesn't have it. They've even purchased titles I've requested if they could not find them at another library. TLDR, your local library might be the best place to get DVDs and Blu-rays these days. Your patron, Andrew. I'm always here to promote the local library. You can get so much stuff at a library, not only books, but ebooks, sewing machines, and yep. apparently DVDs. And I've just been complaining about how I'm kind of missing like <clears throat> solid media. If I, I want, I've assigned my students to watch the movie Alien. If that's not streaming anywhere, where are they going to find it? Mm-hmm. The vintage movie, according to them. <laughs> vintage movie. <laughs> you can even stream movies from your library. You you can log yeah. into apps with your Think library Hoopla. card. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go libraries. Indeed. All right, we got one little note here. What, what do we get from Katie? Well, Katie on Patreon, in response to the latest top five we did about softwares in the 1990, mm-hmm. she says, ICQ gives me mega nostalgia, though I do remember getting up in the university computer lab before class in 2000 and lo- loading it up on AI- AIM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could definitely add cats, dogs, and pets with Z's to the list as well, since that was absolutely my childhood. And After Dark, just because, let's be honest, we all had it in one way or another. Yeah, that was a really good point. It was kind of hard uh, to avoid After Dark being on some <laughs> machine uh, that you had. Thank you, Katie, uh, for, for posting that on the Patreon. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Nikki. Uh, before we get out of here, where should people go to find more of what you do? 
Well, my info is on my website at Nicole Ackermans with an S.com. I'm also at my name, Ackerman Nicole on X and at Nicole Ackermans on Blue Sky. If you guys want to chat with me there. Patrons. We're talking about pasta. <laughs> yeah. Pasta and goat heads. Go check yeah. it out. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Uh, Dr. Nikki and I are going to keep talking. So if you want more, become a patron. And we're going to talk about sci-fi, particularly Apple TV's upcoming sci-fi show, Constellation, because it reminded me of something. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>